Hello, I'm Chris Giles, the Economics Editor of the Financial Times, and it's a great pleasure, I've got the great pleasure today to be talking with Paul Schreer from the OECD about framing measurement beyond GDP. This was a keynote presentation he gave at the ESCO Conference on Economic Management 2021. Um, Paul, I mean, just let's, let's just step back a second and think about why, why, what's motivating the, the thinking behind alternative measures, things that are more inclusive, things that take into account uh, more than GDP? Well, thanks, uh, John, and thanks for having me. I think the uh, discussion about enriching GDP and uh, going beyond the GDP has been with us for some for a couple of decades, actually. Uh, but it has uh, crystallized uh, strongly, I think, uh, under the pandemic, because uh, there is a lot of debate around uh, not going back to business as usual, but uh, using all these efforts that we're engaging in uh, to build back differently or build back better, as the uh, saying goes. And that, of course, has implications for policy, but also for measurement. And uh, we need to take a more inclusive uh, approach in identifying the things that we want to track, uh, while keeping them consistent, however. Uh, so we don't want a huge patchwork of things that don't speak to each other. We want elements that fit into a broader uh, a broader entity and uh, uh, communicate uh, between themselves and give uh, the right message to analysts and policymakers. But let's look, we're going to come into the details in a second of, of, about the areas in which GDP can be extended to other aspects and also what some of the difficulties of doing that. But let's just stick with. I was wondering, just in the motivation still, do you think it's really the case that when we talk about building back better, or we're talking about social welfare, or the environment, does, does the measurement of GDP actually cause a problem? Do, do people not care about uh, these other things sufficiently because we have this measure out there, GDP, which is essentially a monetary aspect? of the economic situation rather than taking these broader things into account? Uh, people, people care a lot about other things. And uh, I think the, the ongoing discussion that we have uh, speaks, speaks to that. GDP does get a lot of attention at the same time uh, for in, in, in many ways for, for good reasons, because it is still the uh, indicator for what is happening around production and the creation of material wealth. Uh, there is no doubt about that. What I'm trying to bring in and what I tried to convey also in this lecture was that GDP cannot stand by itself. It needs to be supplemented by other dimensions really, uh, one being the current well-being dimension, so it, where we go beyond uh, uh, the uh, pure material conditions for households, they are important too, but we have to supplement them with uh, other things that count, well health being one of course these days, but you also have uh, education, having a job, uh, being uh, being safe uh, and so on. So this is about current well-being for today's uh, uh, citizens. And the third aspect, and again, it's something that GDP needs to interact with, is our thinking about uh, what is happening in the future. How can we sustain uh, aspects of well-being into the future, which very naturally brings us into a thinking around capital, and how it can be sustained for future generations. And those three things, GDP production, current well-being, and uh, intertemporal uh, considerations, capital, need to be present, all three of those, uh, without a particular preference given to, to GDP over other aspects that we're looking at. Let's get into the 
some of the, the nitty gritty now. So we know, we know as, you, as you just said, that GDP looks at the material world. Um, well, if we, if we then just think about the, the first aspect of your, your election on the, on, the, on the production sphere, what's wrong with the, the way we are yeah. measuring it at the yeah. moment? What does, it, what does it not include which you think no, can be improved? Yeah, I, 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 uh, right now, I think uh, uh, there are important aspects if, if we remain in the production sphere and sort of don't have the ambition that GDP should do everything, okay, uh, in terms of sustainability or in terms of, of uh, our current well-being, but even within the ambition of uh, uh, mapping uh, inputs and outputs, mainly market inputs and outputs, uh, I think uh, we are missing some uh, natural resources that are not well recognized in our current, uh, in particular in our current calculations of productivity, say. This matters for some countries, it matters less for others, uh, but uh, we do have an incomplete picture about the sources of growth, even very traditionally defined, for example, by not uh, recognizing land as a factor of production. Uh, and uh, so, so those are the things that we can, uh, we can look at. Now, of course, if we want to go beyond it, uh, then uh, we have the big uh, question about what is happening in households that is produced there and which is not reflected in GDP. For good reasons, I think, yeah, because, uh, but uh, what we do there uh, to recognize things like, you know, well, we, we've all seen schooling happening now at home. There's a massive service provided by parents to, to their children, which of course uh, does, is outside, uh, outside GDP. We know about uh, taking care of, uh, of the elderly. We know about, uh, about uh, other services uh, that, are, that are produced very often by women, by the way, which are outside uh, GDP. I think we need to capture them better without necessarily including them into GDP. But, uh, so let's, let's just think about some of the, the productivity aspects just before we, we, we move on. And you, had, you, you put up some rather nice charts that show in that our understanding of total factor productivity, so what you get out for what you put in, might be quite different in certain countries uh, if you looked, if you took into account, as you say, land or other factors of production uh, better than we do now. Just, just talk us through what sort of results you get where people have tried to, to, do, to do this exercise. It is, of course, but uh, I mean, you, you can uh, reason about this on the output side or on the input side. I will just talk about the input side because that's sort of the the easiest way to handle it. If, uh, uh, if you extract resources, say, from the ground, uh, assets that enter your productive system, the uh, income that is associated with uh, these resources, that is part of GDP, of nominal GDP. But if we don't recognize the volume of the flow of these natural resources that enter the economy in our productivity calculation, we will get a wrong input aggregate of capital input. Okay? And uh, we either overestimate or underestimate the capital services that flow in if we only look at produced capital and not at the capital service that comes out of uh, the ground. Now, in it, if we, this is important for resource heavy. That is important for resource. So it counts for Australia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not you include this flow of subsoil assets into the Australian productivity account makes a difference. Typically, actually, it, what happens is that the adjusted or the productivity measure that includes these flows tends to be higher than the one before. 
because uh, things have gotten more efficient and because the flow of resources has grown less quickly than the flow of other capital that was, was used. So the new capital input aggregate has actually grown less rapidly than the old one, which means that you know, your residual is higher. So that, that counts, as you say, in particular for resource intensive countries. Uh, but we can also look at the output side and ask ourselves, uh, how much are we doing by way of, say, combating uh, uh, emissions or pollution? And uh, if you think of, I mean, GDP in a way reflects, or the volume of GDP growth in, uh, reflects those products that are requested by people. Okay, so there's a market price, the goods, so to say. But uh, we can think of uh, a new, a different aggregate that would bring in, uh, that would account for the fact that some of the resources are being used to abate, say, emissions. Okay, no one, I mean, this, there's a shadow price to doing this. So in principle, we are able with some uh, extra, you know, econometrics to uh, impute these marginal costs of abatement and get a somewhat different picture of our output corrected for the bads that we are avoiding. And again, that will paint a different picture of productivity than if we just look at the good output. Uh, so to say. so in, in a way, we, we punish those who do a great job on abating emissions uh, and using resources to do so by only measuring the good outputs. Okay? Uh, so this is analytical work. Of course, it's not something that would naturally be captured in the national accounts as such, but it is information that can be derived from the elements that we have in the national accounts, but also in the SIA, the system of environmental uh, economic accounts that is also out there as a statistical standard. This sort of brings us, I think, very naturally to one of the big questions that I have, which is what, what's your view, how is it best to reflect these issues? Clearly, they are incredibly important, these inequality, these other aspects, which I think we'll come on to talk about in a second, on the household side as well, uh, in the environment, climate change. Is it best to try and find a way to find prices, to put them into a national accounts perspective, put them into the accounts themselves or is it best to measure them in their own right and have a sort of a dashboard which is rather like the OECD's better lives index uh, where, you, where you can look at these things individually but you don't try and put them all into one index that sort of tells us everything about everything. I think it's the latter. Uh, so one can go some way down the avenue of aggregating things uh, but uh, Personally, I don't think that our ambition should be to go all the way down in our ambition to have sort of the single uh, indicator that tells us everything about uh, sustainability of our, of our economic, social, and environmental, environmental system. The reason is simply that uh, things become very complex uh, in terms of measurement or even conceptually as you if you want to go down that avenue. Uh, I mean, think of uh, uh, on the, the social side, uh, for example, uh, we're talking about social capital, which is important for uh, how cohesive our societies are. How do we measure that? Well, we measure it in terms of, say, the trust that people have uh, in each other or the trust that people have in government. Well, those are important indicators. You can look at them, you can compare them, but it's very hard to put a money, a money value on this, uh, and especially in an intertemporal context, because you would have to say, okay, future generations trust. I mean, how much are we willing to pay for this today? So I think we, we'd be exhausting ourselves to try and put a, 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 a fully valid monetary value on this today probably even at the expense of being more sort of uh, uh, comprehensive in our alternative measures. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go some way down this avenue and we can do so and work exists. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that the whole reference framework is, is not useful, quite the opposite. It's good to have this out there, 
but what theory tells us needs to be uh, confronted with what is doable in uh, in statistical terms and in measurement terms. Yes. Now let's talk about some of the other areas where there is maybe slightly easier than trust in government. Uh, yeah. Just on the household yeah. side, where we, there, there's interesting things have happened, particularly in the past year, where we've seen the income side of the accounts be very different from the output side of the accounts or national accounts. Just talk us through you know, what, what this is telling us and how this might mean that we can make improvements to the way the national accounts are based. The uh, well, I mean, the, the difference between income and uh, or the different side of the accounts that is a very sort of intrinsic statistic issue, which has more to do, I guess, with the types of sources and methodologies that we use to put the accounts uh, together. But in terms of the in terms, I think of, you're more about things like that and then distribution and all these other yes, exactly. aspects which, which we which we know are really important. No one, no yeah. one thinks they're not, no, important, so but they're not very, reflected within the accounts themselves. I, I agree. So a very important uh, next step, and this is actually being on the agenda right now, is to introduce uh, distributional information into our standard accounts. So right now, of course, what we have in the national accounts are aggregates, uh, but we don't know how they uh, how they are distributed across socioeconomic groups in our in our country. And uh, the natural starting point is income, uh, but it's not the end point, of course, uh, because you also want to look at consumption, for example, and you want to look at wealth. Uh, or uh, assets. And actually, you need all three of those to make a good statement about where the most vulnerable parts of our societies are, because uh, it's really at the interface of those, of those three aspects that, uh, that you can identify, identify the group you want to target. But uh, having distributional measures that are consistent with the national accounts will be a very important step forward because uh, right now we are facing a statistical situation where there is extremely useful work going forward uh, say on income distribution or consumption distribution that is based on surveys but unfortunately it's not quite compatible with the uh, um, aggregate picture that we get in the national accounts because income is defined differently the national accounts have parts in there that are not uh, a part of the surveys uh, to a point where some even if you look just at income per capita the survey development may go in a different direction from the national accounts development which you know it leaves us leaves you sort of on your uh, out there and you don't know what's going on uh, so the the introduction of uh, consistent distributional information into the accounts is something that is important. It is going ahead. Uh, I mean, there are projects internationally. We have one here at the OECD. This is also part of the uh, update agenda for the system of national accounts that is just uh, starting now. Now, you, in, in your lecture, you, you said ultimately your conclusion was that we should be very pragmatic in the way yes. we we go forward. Can you just say what, what, what is the pragmatism? What is you know? There, there's the there are you know the extremes of people say that GDP is everything. Sometimes we, we in the media are accused of being in that camp, and then people say it's it's valueless. It's, there's no point. It's a useless number. What what where 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 do you see the balance lying between these and the pragmatic way forward? The pragmatic way forward is to complement, uh, well, first, probably to adjust GDP at the margin to bring in things like I mentioned before, natural resources and so on, where this is where this is needed. But in, more importantly, so to complement GDP with other measures that are as compatible as possible with uh, what we have in GDP. Okay, I was mentioning household uh, production. We should have a sort of a regular screening of what is going on in households, but do this in a way that we can actually compare it with GDP. You know? So the classifications are similar, 
uh, the, the, the accounting rules are similar. This is a, a level of pragmatism that is important. Can be a bit boring at times because it's a very down to earth statistical work, but it's really essential. Otherwise, we are out there and have two things that can't be compared. Same on the well being side. We want to go some way, uh, bringing in, uh, as I say, distributional measures compatible with the account so we can actually say what is happening to. GDP production, how it tri triggers, trickles down to households and not just to households as a whole, but to different income groups of households or consumption groups. Uh, and there may be, there will be other, uh, other dimensions of uh, the quality of life that we can't plug in there, but still monitor them on an ongoing basis. That's what I, what I see with pragmatism. Exactly as possible without having an, uh, an ambition of doing everything uh, perfectly. And I, and I think one thing that's very important, certainly for, our, for us in the media is really um, crucial, yeah. is where it may, maybe not be possible to put things into one index, uh, at least having them internationally compa comparable. And the, the work of the OECD here is absolutely yeah. crucial in giving us some confidence in being able to use statistics on all aspects of our lives and how and how they're getting better or worse, uh, but we we know that those we can actually use these as comparisons rather than uh, just being worried that we're just measuring different things. I'm very sorry, but I think we're out of time, Paul. It was a very very interesting lecture, and thank you very much um, for speaking with me today. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Good seeing you. <coughs> thank you.